If you recognize this screen, it should bring you all the way back to the good old days. Back when you connected to bulletin boards or quantum link with your 1670 auto modem, just to trade SID player music files with other users. I used to love coming home from school and seeing what music files were uploaded by the users of my bulletin board from the night before. My Commodore board ran from 1985 to 1990 before it changed it to a PC board. Oh, I wish I kept those discs. The only thing that really survived was the ANS you from the PC out of my bulletin board. Well, the program that you see here is a program that I used back in the day to listen to SID music at home. But let's go back a couple years to 1985 in the book All About the Commodore 64 Part 2 by Craig Chamberlain. This book introduced us to SID Player, and it was a program that played music files, .mus files, and in later versions added support for karaoke mode and for pictures as well. The book is built on four parts that covered in great detail how to program advanced basic, bitmap graphics, a sprite control system, and of course, the SID Player. In this video, I'm gonna show you how it was like to get the SID Player up and running by using this book, how to create music with the SID Editor, how to include music in your own basic and assembly or machine language programs. This is going to be really fun. Well, let's get started. So the section starts out by talking about music in the SID player. And they kind of talk about electronic music in general, and so just some real basic theory. And then they talk about the specifics of the SID chip. The very first thing they want to do is have a way to play the music that they're going to talk about in this book. And you need to type it in. It's a giant basic program. However, if you look at the source code here, there's like little REM statements next to it, a number next to it. The book comes with another basic program called the Automatic Proofreader. And that is used to key in this program. <laughs> so first you get yourself Automatic Proofreader. So once you have this typed in, you type run to install it into memory. And then you get this message that the proofreader is active. And every time you press enter or you type something, you get this little number at the top of the screen. So as you key in the program, you can verify that the code is correct. And I'll start with line 166, because it's really short. If I type in this line, I see 102. And in a program listing, it says 102. I know it's correct. However, it's not foolproof. One of the things you'll notice, there are certain common typos that will give the same checksum. So for example, if you have this line of code, you get 197. If you were to accidentally type it as XC and do it backwards, it gives you the same checksum number. That the checksum will get most of the bugs, but it's definitely not perfect. So I gotta imagine typing this in would have been a challenge. With that said, for $13, you could call them and they would send you a disk with the software on it. The book itself was $17. So depending on your patience, you probably forked out the $13 and just made your life a lot easier. But if you were faint of wallet, you could type this in. The player wasn't too bad. The basic part's pretty short. So you key the whole program in. It's not very long. It's like a page and a half. And now you have the player, or most of it. So now we've typed in the automatic proofreader and the player. So if we load the player in, and then you run it, which is the basic program we just typed in, you get this message, file not found. The mass majority of the player logic is in a machine language program that this basic program tries to load in. So if you look at the machine language source, you'll notice that it's just a memory address and a bunch of bytes to type in. Well, to type this in, you gotta type in another basic program called the MLX. All right, so you type in MLX, you load up this basic program, you give it a run and it asks you for the starting address. And then on this page here, you can see that it starts at 49, 349, ends at 51118. And then you just start typing in and you kind of type in those numbers. And then the very last number is a checksum. So if you type it right, you get a little beep. Uh, if you type it wrong, you get a little buzz. So you type all this in, and then you save it to a file called sid.obj. So now we've got the automatic proofreader, we've got the player, we've typed in MLX, and we've typed in the machine language portion of the player. So does our player work yet? So let's load it up. You go to run it. 
And this time it's going to find the machine language code. It's going to bring it in. But it says there's no music files on the disk. So we got the player, which is cool. But now we need a song to play. Well, they give you a bunch of songs you can type in. So we're going to type in one song. We're going to type in Commodore.mus. And this you get to use MLX as well. What makes this interesting, though, is you'll notice that there's a starting address and an ending address. Since you are typing it in as if it were machine language, but it's not. It's actually just a data file. And we're just using MLX to type it in because it's a convenient way to get into the system. So let's key that in. So now our disk looks like this. We've typed in two music files, ETAL and Commodore. So our SID player should be able to see those now. So let's load our player back up. And now we're ready to go. You have to admit, the original SID player was pretty basic looking. <laughs> it came a long way in its later versions. So let's play Commodore. Notice how it doesn't show the .mus extensions of the file on the disk. In fact, it's only showing files with a .mus extension. So we'll type in Commodore. It's going to load into memory. And it plays it. Now if I hit run stop, you notice that the music continues to play. The machine language routine is hooked into the IRQ handler and uh, 60 times a second, the routine is called by the kernel to play the music in the background. Pretty cool. We're gonna press run stop restore to, uh, to shut that off. So now we've got two music files. We've got a player, we've got the player machine language. How do we create these? Let's restart here. But now we need an editor to edit music and it is a monstrous project. It is 19 pages of basic source code. And as we said earlier, using the automatic proofreader, it's not uncommon to get a ton of bugs in it, even after you type it in. So once you have it typed in, you'd think you're ready to go. So now we have the editor. It is a 90 block basic program. Like I said, it is huge. So you load it up. So then you go to run it, and you get an error, and you can't see from here, but the drive light's blinking. Just like the player, there's also a machine language component to this. So you have to crank out MLX, and luckily, it's actually just an addition to the SID that OBJ that we keyed in before. So they have you load the SID OBJ in into MLX, and then add another I don't know, page and a half of code, and then you have everything you need for the editor. So let's go. Okay, so much data entry. At this point, we must be ready to go. There's editor.obj, a 10 block machine language program. So once again, we're gonna load the editor basic program. Then we run it. It's loading in the machine language portion. At this point, it's actually getting itself ready. So it turns yellow, then it's gonna turn pink for a minute. And now we're ready to roll. So here we are in the SID Music Editor. A couple really quick important facts about the editor before we start using it. This is the first version of the SID Editor, and we're using this one because it's just historically interesting. This was the first one. The later editor that came in a book after this is actually far superior to this, but I find it just so interesting to use the original version. This editor is written in BASIC, and for a basic program, it's pretty impressive. But because it's written in BASIC, it is insanely slow. There's a lot of lag and a lot of pausing while you're using it. With that said, the first song we're going to enter into our SID editor is Mary Had a Little Lamb. I chose this song for a few reasons. First, it's super simple, so it's very easy to enter the notes into the editor. More importantly, it's public domain, so YouTube should not have a problem with it. Hopefully, I guess we'll see. So let's get started. So we're going to press 2 to edit music. And it's going to ask you which voice do we want to work with. So you're entering the sheet music well, one voice at a time. And if you look at the sheet music here, we can see uh, what are basically two voices. The treble clef will be voice one, and we'll use the bass clef for voice two, and three will be blank. Press one for voice one. You really need to print out a cheat sheet for the keys. The user interface doesn't really give you any hints as how to use it. So we're just going to start with the real basics of it. So the screen's kind of built into three sections. At the very top is some information about the voice we're on, 
uh, the key signature of the piece of music we're about to key in and how much memory is left and if we're in measure mode. The middle part shows you everything about the note that you're going to enter into the note stream. And the very bottom, that little light blue bar, is what I call the note stream. So as you enter notes and other things, it appears there uh, going from left to right. So before we even enter some notes, we want to enter what I would consider header type of information about the song. So we're going to press F3, and that brings up what they call the special operations menu. So these aren't notes, but it changes uh, music from this point forward. And the first thing you want to do is set the tempo. So to move this little cursor around, you can see how much delay there is. Uh, you use the joystick, and then you press either enter or the fire button to enter a value. So the tempo you would type in, in this case, 80 for this sheet music here. So if the tempo for this song, it's 80. So we'll type in 80 and we'll press enter. And it's gonna insert that command into the note stream. Now you'll see that it made it a 78 and that's okay. It just kind of rounds it to the nearest value that the SID player can work with. So we're gonna be entering eight measures of music. So we wanna let the SID editor know that we're working on the first measure. And you just press the F7 key and it inserts a measure marker. And every time you press F7, it'll add another measure marker and increase it by one. So when we get to the second measure, pressing again, we'll see measure two and three and so on. Now, this song is in the key of C, but I'm gonna show you how you can change the key. So when you enter notes, you can type in the note value and it won't key it in, but it's just gonna tell you the note we're gonna do. So you can type in C through B, right, to get the different notes, all right? If you wanted to enter it as a flat, you'd press minus, and you'll see that the flat indicator gets turned on, or I can press plus to make it a sharp, and a sharp indicator comes on. And if I press, um, oops, I pressed zero by accident, which brought me to octave zero. <laughs> if you press the note again, uh, it goes to the natural. Just to kind of go back a second, if you press the numbers on the keyboard, it will switch the octave that we're putting in. So we're going to start with the fourth octave in E. It's natural. In the key of C, all of the notes are natural in the song. But if you had sheet music in a different key, what you do is you press shift plus or shift minus to either go in a fifth direction or the fourth direction to different keys. So if I were to press shift plus, I would go to the key of G. The key of G has one sharp in it, and that's F sharp. So now if I press F on a keyboard, you'll notice that it defaults to F sharp because in the key of G, all that's are sharp. And if I were to go to the key of D, now I have two sharps, F and C. Now we're just gonna keep this in the key of C where everything is natural. All right, so we're gonna enter quarter notes. So quarter notes is the default length of the note we're gonna enter. Uh, oops, we wanna press C again to make sure it's natural. Um, sorry, we're going to press E to make sure it's natural. And I'm just going to enter the first four notes in their first measure. So you choose E, which we did. We press Enter to add it to the note stream. And then we'll add a D, a C, and a D. So that's the first measure. Then we press F7, and it lets the editor know we're working on measure two. And this one is E, E. And now we need to change it to a half note. And we press the H key to change the length of the half note. So we'll enter that. We'll press F7 to get measure three. This becomes D, go to quarter note, and I'll just finish typing in these measures. Press W to get a whole note and C. So there we've typed in the entire first voice. So now we can press F1. That brings us back to the main menu. And we can press one to play it back to see how it sounds. It's gonna ask you, do you want voice one? And you can press yes, yes, yes. It'll play all three voices. And now it plays our notes. If you press F7 while it's playing, it's gonna stop the music. And when you press two to edit it, choose voice one, it's gonna bring you right to where you stop the music. So if you are making a fix, you can hit F7 and go right to where the problem is. Now, one thing I don't like is how slow that tempo is. So we're gonna press F2 
and that'll fast forward us to the front of the note stream for this voice. We're going to press F3, and we're going to change this tempo to be twice as fast. So let's change it to 160. All right, we're going to press F1, and then we're going to play it, and let's see how it sounds. Now you can just press Enter here, and it plays all three voices. I think this is a better tempo. Cool, so that's one voice. So we're gonna edit this, voice two, and let's now put in the bass clef. So we're gonna go drop down to, I don't know, I think it's octave two, octave three. There we go, add it to C. And these are half notes, so we're gonna press F7. Now what you'll notice is it puts in measure nine. That's not really where we are. So we're gonna go back and we're gonna edit this. The arrow keys work a little weird. The horizontal arrow keys move their cursor to the right, the up and down move it to the left. A little confusing, but not too bad. Uh, we're gonna press F3. To get to the measure number, we're gonna press the joystick up. There it is, okay. I'm gonna press Enter, and this is gonna be measure one. So now let's go to half notes. We're gonna use H, and we'll start with uh, C. Then we have to go to octave two for that G. So that'll be half note. We'll put in an F7 for the next measure number, measure number two. And then we're gonna go back to octave three and the C, and I'll just keep typing these in. There we are, we've entered voice two. So let's see what our song sounds like. We'll press F1 to go to the main menu, and we'll press one to play it. And then we'll press enter to play all three voices. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so of course, what makes this a chip so interesting is you can change the sound of those voices. So they give you a chart in a book with a nice selection of instruments that you can configure. And this chart looks pretty intimidating, uh, but we're gonna change one of our voices to be one of these sounds. So we're gonna edit the music and we're gonna edit voice one. All right, so here we are at the front of the song. And before the first measure, we wanna insert commands that are gonna define the voice that we're playing with. So I'm gonna look at the chart and we'll do one of the easier ones where there's less parameters to type in. Let's make it sound like a, a flute. That sounds pretty good. If you look at the chart, you'll see that there's one, two, three, four, five, six parameters that we need to define. We're gonna press the insert key six times. This will give us six spaces to enter these commands. And these are entered on the F3 menu. So the first we need to do is set the attack. So we're gonna look up here for attack. Press enter, and the flute wants an attack of three. So I'm gonna press three. Now, normally when you press enter, which I just did here, it brings us back to the screen, but we wanna enter another five commands and that's kind of tedious. So let's press F3 again. And the flute would like a decay of zero. So we're gonna use a joystick to go over here. Press enter, put the zero. Instead of pressing enter, you press shift enter and it keeps you on the screen. So now we can enter some of the other parameters. We need a sustain of 14, press shift enter. We need a release of four. So we'll put four, press shift enter. And just two more parameters. We need a, we needed a, an R point, which I'll be honest, we're not quite sure what that is, but we'll press enter here and we'll type in one. Oops, I didn't press shift enter. So we have to go back into F3. And then we just need a waveform of triangle. So the waveform is over here. Press enter, we want triangle, which is one. And we'll press enter. So now our first voice should sound quite different, uh, like a flute. So we're gonna press F1 and let's play it. Awesome. So now we've changed the voice. So there are more interesting things you can do with the Sid music other than just play it. 
when we get into the next section where we have our basic program playing this music, you can have the music play the basic program. And what I mean by that is we can put commands into our music that signal to the player to do things. So let me show you what I mean by that. We're going to edit, uh, we'll edit voice two, and we'll put them in here. We're going to press F2 to go to the front of the song. So let me show you that what the command is, and I'll explain what it does. So we're going to press right to go here. We're going to press insert to insert a space, and we're going to press F3 to go to the option menu. And down in this miscellaneous section, there's a command called flag. When you press enter, you can put a flag into the stream of notes, and it stores a value between 0 and 255. So we'll just put in 1 for our first flag. When we write our player code in the future of this video, you can read those flag values from memory, and your program can react on it. So let's put some flags in here, and then when we get to the basic program, I'll show you what kind of cool things you can do with it. So for measure 1, we put an FLG of 1. Let's go over here to measure 2. I'm going to press insert, we'll press F3, and we'll put a flag value of 2 here. All right, we'll write a couple here. So you can really see how slow it is. Uh, we'll press insert here, we'll do F3, we'll grab a flag value of 3, and I'll just do the other measures here. All right, so we've entered these flag codes. It's going to be very cool when we get to use them in our basic program. So let's jump back to the main menu with F1, and let's save our music file. So we're going to press 4. Now, as you may have noticed in the SID player, you can insert text into your music file so you can describe the name of the song and maybe who authored it. So we're going to choose yes for this. And we have a little text box down here where we can type in three lines of text. So we'll just type in, Mary had a little lamb, and we'll just press enter for these. And then we we'll give this a file name, so we'll call it Mary. And now it's going to save it to disk. And to be sure it's saved, we'll press 5. And there's our song. One block, really short. <laughs> All right. Let's jump into basic and make a player to play it back. So now we've reached the final chapter in the SID player part of this book. And this chapter discusses how to merge the music and your basic program. So let's take a look at what we have on our disc so far in this journey, learning how to use the SID player. So of course, just to reiterate where we've come so far, we had to type in automatic proofreader in order to type in the player. And then we had to type in MLX in order to type in SID.obj, which is the machine language routines for the player. Then we used MLX to key in two music songs, ETAL and Commodore. And then we used the automatic proofreader again to type in the monstrous editor program. Then we had to use MLX to make changes to SID.obj to make the editor.obj. And the editor.obj is machine language routines for the editor. And then we used the editor to create our first music file, Mary. We've done a lot so far. There's one more program that we need to type in. In chapter 11, they give you a really short version of the player that's intended for you to use in your own basic programs. So let's type that in and load it up. Okay, so we've typed in sid.bass. So we're gonna load this into memory. And this program is split into two parts. There's code at lines 57,000 and forward. And this is all of the inside baseball to how it loads the machine language and loads your music file and gets it ready for playback. We're going to ignore that for the moment. And we're going to deal with the front end of the program, which runs from line 100 to 280. We're not going to deep dive into all of this quite yet. First, we want to get our program up and running. And then when we get that going, I'll deep dive into how this actually works we're going to make it play our song. So by default, it plays the Commodore song. We're just going to change this variable f$ to Mary. Then we're going to ignore the rest of this code for the moment. Then we're going to look at these two lines down here, 250 and 260. At this point in the code, the variable ss has been defined to be 49152. ss stands for SID status. That memory just contains a byte where the first three bits, bits 0, 1, and 2, contain which voices are currently playing. When you start the player up and you load your music in, it initializes that value to zero. And until you turn the SID voices on, your song doesn't play. So this line here, 
pokes a 7, which is bit zeros 1 and 2, or voices 1, 2, and 3, and it immediately starts playing. This line of code looks at the memory address SS, which again is 49152. It masks out those three bits, and as long as they are non-zero, it'll go into a loop and keep going until the song is done. The SID player, when a song is completed, will set those voices off. So that'll turn to zero, and then a program will end. We're going to add one little piece of code in here to interact with those flag commands that we put into the song earlier. So at line 255, so we're going to read the flag from memory and put it into the border color. So how do we do that? Well, we'll start with the easy part. Poke 53280. 53280 is the memory address that the VIC chip looks at to decide what color it's going to paint the border. And then we're going to tell it to pull that value by peeking at SS, which is SID status, plus one, close parenthesis. That's it. And then we're going to change line 260 to instead of going to 265, go to 255. So what does this code do now? SS plus one, which is 49153, that memory address will hold the value of the last flag that was set into music. So by default, it's zero. So when we run our program, the screen should turn black. And as it runs into those flag commands while it's playing the song, our border color will change. Now, as you can imagine, we could do some really cool stuff with that in a more advanced program. Maybe we could trigger animations or we could trigger uh, sequences in our game to do things. But it's really neat how we can have the music drive parts of our software. So let's give this a run and see how this works. At this point, it's loading the SID player into memory, and then it's going to load our music file into memory. And there it is. You can see the flag commands driving our border colors. You can also see the text was pulled out of the file that we put in the editor and displayed on the screen. Very cool. So that's how easy it is to get started by integrating the SID player music with your own basic programs. Now let's deep dive into what's actually happening. So we're going to do run, stop, restore to get our colors back. And then let's take a look at the first front part of this program. There's a lot going on. So let's start with the very beginning part. Very, very first line is pretty straightforward. Close the screen, put SID player by Craig Chamberlain. Next line of code, we start getting serious. So line 20, we have device number equals eight. So when we use our routines, that's the driver it's going to use. The next four variables are really, really interesting. S, A, X, Y, and P. 780, 781, 72, and 783 are really interesting memory addresses. It's part of what I would almost consider a miniature API for the sys command for SYS. Most of us know SYS as you put a memory address and it basically in machine language does a JSR to that memory address, waits till it hits an RTS and then comes back to basic. But there's more to it than that. When you run the sys command, it takes the values in 780 and puts it into the accumulator, 781 into the X register, 782 into the Y register, and 783 into the processor status. And then it calls the JSR routine. We can call routines that take parameters from the CPU registers. But not only that, when the machine language RTS is back to basic, sys will take the current state of the CPU after the routine is called and put them back into those memory locations. So we can pass parameters back and forth to machine language routines where needed. The next line of code says go sub 57,000. That block of code is going to load sid.obj into memory. And we'll dig into that in a little bit. The next line of code says f$, which is the file that we want to work with. Um, we want to load that into memory. And it loads it into memory by calling the routine at 57,500. The variable LA stands for load address. And we're telling that routine that we're going to load that song into a very specific spot in memory. Now, here's where it gets interesting. The SID player basic code here loads the music file right into the middle of unallocated basic memory, which is kind of smart. So instead of making you resize basic and kind of play some games, which you can do if you want, it just loads it into where there's unallocated variables. LA is being assigned the memory address stored in memory locations 49 and 50. 49 and 50 is a pointer to the end of basic array storage area, plus one, or the start of free memory. So it looks for where all your variables are done being defined, which is normally an empty block of memory before strings start, which starts at the other end of basic. 
and then they add a thousand extra bytes just in case you create more variables and use more memory while the music is playing. So it gives it a little bit of buffer room. So at line 210, we call syshk. That's called the hook, and it installs the player to sit in the background. Uh, at this point, the player is in the background. It's not playing any songs yet. It's not really doing anything, but it's ready to, to go. So now we need to tell the player where in memory the song is located. Now, what you don't see here is when we go subbed 57500 line 200, it assigned the variables low and high to the low and high address values of where the song is. So we load those into the X and Y register using SX and XY. We call the player, and now that gets the player ready. It sets all the variables. The flag to zero sets all the default voices and does gets everything ready to go. Now, when that function finishes, it returns into 780 and 781 and those variable, the memory address of where those text lines are in memory so we can print it to the screen. So we assign the value K, the memory address of where the text lines are in memory. That was the title, Mary had a little lamb that we put into the file. And that was returned from calling syspl. The next line of code iterates through that memory address one at a time and prints it to the screen. When it hits a null or a character zero, it's done and then it stops printing that text. We talked about the player code before. We turn the voices on, we check our flag, we go into a loop, and then when our song is done, we sys dp, and again it's a variable that's set a little bit later, and that unhooks the player from memory, and then the, and then we're back to normal and our program ends. Now let's dive into what these routines do. So the first routine we're going to look at is this 57,000, and this line of code is what loads the sid player machine language into memory. So there's a lot going on here. What this code is doing is it's using a kernel to load a file into memory. And let's just talk about what that means. The kernel has three routines that are needed to load a file into memory. The first kernel routine is called set LFS. And that's going to set the logical file number, a device number, and what's called a secondary address. The next thing it needs to do is called set name, where we tell the kernel the name of the file that we're going to be working on. And then the third thing we do is we call load, which loads that file into memory. Now let's really break it down. And remember, SA, SX, and SY are accumulator X and Y index registers. So that first line of code of 57,000 is going to call set LFS. So the accumulator gets the file number, and we're just going to use one. You can pretty much make up any file number you want. The device number, that was that drive eight, so that goes into the X register. The Y register gets what's called a secondary address. We'll talk about that in just a moment, but just know that we're passing in the number one, and then it calls that routine. And then that routine uh, sets that into the kernel. Then we tell, then we say that F dollar is to that OBJ, and then we go sub 59,000. So now let's look at what 59,000 does. 59,000 prepares to call the set name kernel routine. What it's doing is it's finding an obscure spot in memory to put the file name in. That name requires a pointer in memory to the file name, and it wants the accumulator to have the number of characters that are in it. That's that first part there where it sets the accumulator to the length of F dollar, the number of characters in the file name. And then it needs to set to the X and Y register the address of the file name. And it's setting it to 73 and two and if you do the math on that, it's memory just 585. What's significant about memory just 585? It's just a little buffer spot that's not normally used, and we're just temporarily copying the file name string in there from basic, and then we call set name, and it's set. So now if we go back to the beginning part of this, 57,000 so far has set LFS and has set the name. Now we're ready to actually load into memory. So we're going to prepare to call the load kernel call. We set the accumulator to zero, which means we're going to load the file, not verify it. And at this point, everything is configured and ready for the load function to run. So when we call it 65493, it goes out to disk. Because we set the secondary address to one, it's going to load the file into memory of where the file is designed to go. Let's take one quick step backwards. A PRG file on the Commodore 64 has a two byte header, and those two bytes contain the memory address of where the file naturally loads into. So using a secondary address of one tells the load command to just load the file into memory like it would load comma eight comma one off the disk. The call to load will load into the processor status in the zero bit 
uh, flag whether or not the load was successful. If it was successful, that bit will be zero and we will just move on. If there's a value there, it goes to 59100 that prints the error. All right, so it's successful. Now we get into those variables that we used earlier. We set the SID status to 49152. And remember, that's the address that tells us which voices are playing and we can control the voices and we can read the voices. HK's hook, that's the memory location of the routine that we called earlier to initialize the player and get it into memory. PL is a routine that gets called, which we talked about earlier, that tells a player to initialize itself and get ready to play the song. And DP is the routine that uninstalls the player from memory. So it returns and then the program continues. So now we've covered getting the SID.obj into memory. And now we're at line 200 where we're gonna load our song into memory. So this basically shares a lot of code with the SID.obj where although instead of using the secondary address of one from local file, we're gonna set it to zero because we're gonna load it into a very specific place of memory. So let's take a look at the subroutine 57500 which does that. So 57500, just like 57000, it starts with calling set LFS. So set the file number to one, the device number to eight, and then we're setting the secondary address to zero because we're gonna be loading it into a different address than what the file says it is. We call set LFS, we append.mus to the file name because we're gonna be loading in mary.mus, and then we go sub 59000, and 59000, is a routine that prepares set names. So it copies our file name into that little buffer. It calls the set name routine and it comes back. And then we take the load address and we turn it back into a high low value. So we set high to equal the high part of the, of the uh, load address and, and low to be the low part of the load address. And now we're gonna prepare for the load call. So this one, this time it's a little bit different. We're gonna set the accumulator to zero. Again, we're doing a load, so just like before. We're going to set the X register to the low value of the memory that we're loading into and the Y register to the high part of the memory just we're loading into. And then we call load. And this load is going to ignore the two byte header in a file and load it to where we told it to load, which is kind of in the middle of free memory of basic. So now our music file is loaded into memory. So now it calls routine called hook. What does hook actually do? The way that the music player works is it hooks itself into the IRQ handler. And the IRQ handler, which is defined at memory just 0314, this is a routine that the kernel calls 60 times a second by default. And I'll use the word by default because you can configure it to do all sorts of interesting things. So once that's in there, now in the background, 60 times a second, the IRQ handler is on top of dealing with things like the cursor and the timers. It's also calling our music player to play music in the background. Now we need to call the play routine. We want to tell the player to get ready to play the song that we've loaded into memory. So we set the X and Y registers, again, to the low and high value of the memory just over the song is sitting in memory, and we call the play routine. That play routine just does a whole bunch of stuff like resets the voices, gets the flag set to zero, and just prepares the player's song. We already mentioned how it pulls the text out of the song, and then it starts playing our song, and it waits for us to finish. When our song finishes, we call this DP, this drop routine, which unhooks the IRQ handler and restores it back to normal. And our program is done. Like I said, there's a whole lot going on there, but luckily, as you saw from the very beginning of this part of the section, you don't really need to know how any of this works to easily integrate this music player into your basic programs. Now let's explore how to play a song using assembly language. So we're gonna use the Laser Genius Assembler by Ocean to put this together. And we load that with gen asm, comma eight, comma one. I have an entire video on how to use this assembler. So definitely check that out if you've not seen this assembler before. When you fire it up, it's gonna ask you a very important question. Do you want the assembler to reside in the low portion of memory or in a high portion of memory? So to answer this question, we need to think about what we're doing. So we know that the SID player is at 49152, which is C000. So right away, we know we can't use the high memory version because the assembler sits right where we need the player to be. So we're gonna choose the low version. Now keep an eye on that memory address there. The low version runs from 800 to 47 FF. What that means is that the source code will reside from 4800 to the rest of RAM. 
We can't have that either. So we're going to choose the low memory version first. And then it's going to load up the assembler into the low portion of memory. Okay. When the assembler starts, it's going to ask us text memory with a question mark, which seems kind of like a mysterious prompt. What it's asking for us is what portion of memory do you want to use for text? And as I said just a few seconds ago, it defaults to 4800 to the rest of RAM. So we'll start with 4800, because that's where we want the source code to be. But we do need to reserve a pretty big portion of memory for our program. I want to put the program at $8,000. We're going to load the music into $9,000. And the SID player is going to be at $C00. So we need to have our source code end at 7FFF. All right. So that gives us 14.5K for our source code. Not a big deal. We got plenty of room. Since I loaded Laser Genius on drive 8, I put in our SID player disk into drive 9. So we type in device 9 to switch to drive 9. And we're going to type DIR to see what's on our disk. So we need to load a couple things into memory. Let's load the SID player into memory. And we're going to use the mload command, the machine language load command. And we're going to load SID.obj. This is the equivalent of loading a file come 8, come 1. It just loads it into memory. We're also going to load our music file into memory. Okay, we're going to mload commodore.mus. We're going to mix it up a little bit. And we're going to load that into memory address 9000. All right, we've got our player in memory and we have our music file memory. Let's write some code. So we'll put auto numbering on and we're going to write a program that can play the music file memory from the player in memory. So let's start by using the pseudo mnemonic.org, which tells the assembler where in memory we're going to put our program and we're going to put it at 8000. Now what we're going to do is we're going to refer to that basic program that we wrote and we're going to declare the same variables in our assembler program so we can use them. And we're even going to use the decimal. This way it's easy for us to translate. So we'll create an equate called SS and we'll make that equal 49152. And remember that was the SID status. We're going to say HK equals 49435. That's the hook that installs the IRQ handler for the player. Uh, PL is going to equal 49458. Again, that's the routine that we call when we have the music file memory to initialize the player. And I'm going to find DP as 496, 49629. And that's the routine we call to clean everything up. All right, very straightforward. We don't have to deal with loading everything to memory because it's already in memory. So we're just going to JSR HK. That's going to install the IRQ handler. And now we're ready to initialize the song. So if you remember, we need to load X and Y with a memory address of where the music is going to be. Well, it's at 9,000. So we have to load X with a low value of that, which we know is 0, 0. We're going to load Y with the high value portion of it, which is 90. So 90, 00, 9,000, pretty straightforward. We will JSRPL. Now that's going to return in the XY registers the area of where the text string is, but we're just writing a simple player, so we're just going to ignore that. Now we want to start playing the music, and you do that by, by setting bits 0, 1, and 2 uh, in memory address SS or 49152 to uh, ones. So we're going to load the accumulator, and we're going to use the binary. Oops, we're going to use the binary formatting, and go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Those last three ones is voice 1, 2, and 3. We're going to store that in SS. That'll start the player. And then we'll just return from subroutine. So at this point, this should load the player into the background, initialize it, and play a song, and then return control to the assembler, and the song should continue on. So let's see how well this works. So we're going to ASM, comma M, we're going to assemble it to memory. It assembled. And uh, since we're daring, we're just going to run it without even saving it. So sys8000. And pretty cool. It's running in the background. Awesome. So now we need to write some more code to handle maybe waiting for a key press and shutting down the music. So we're going to press run stop restore so we can restore the vectors and turn that music off for a moment. And with laser genius, you just press no for new and it'll continue where it left off. So let's list our program. Uh, let's get rid of that line 120. We don't need that anymore. And let's add some more code here. So let's add a piece of code that's going to wait for a key press. So this is pretty straightforward. We're going to call the kernel routine FFE4. 
that will check if a key has been pressed in the keyboard. It will set the zero status flag of our CPU if nothing has been pressed. So we're gonna say uh, branch if the zero flag is set to wait key. So that'll just loop until someone presses uh, something. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna load into the accumulator all zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This shows that we're setting all three voices off. We're gonna store that in the SID status. Now, because assembler is so quick, we need to call the play initialize code to force it to shut off the sounds and everything. Basic is so slow that you don't have to do that, but here we need to ensure that we turn a player off. Then we're gonna JSR to DP to drop the inner paneler, and then we're gonna RTS, and that's the whole program. So if we list this out, it's pretty straightforward. Let's save the source code before we lose it. So we're gonna save this as test.s. And now how do we save this to a binary that we could run outside of the assembler? But we have everything in RAM, so all we have to do is tell our assembler to save that block of memory to disk. And we do that with the msave command. So we're gonna save this to test, and we're gonna start at 8,000. Now, where do we save it to? Well, let's go down here for a minute. We know that the player's memory address is from 49349 to 51118, because that's what MLX had us type in when we keyed it in. So let's figure out what that is in hex. So 51118. And in hex, that's C7AE. So we wanna save from 8,000 to C7AF. You need to add one for the msave command because it's, it's the end address plus one. So we're gonna press enter on that. Now it's saving. Now, admittedly, it's gonna save a pretty huge block of memory. And there's a lot of empty space in between our code, our music, and our player. But that is a video for another day. All right, let's restart our computer. All right, let's take a look in drive nine. And there's our test program, 73 blocks. That's rather large, but that's all right. So we're gonna load that into RAM. And then all we have to do is type sys32768 to run it. And here we go, we did it in machine language. So of course that program is monstrous, 73 blocks. There's so much empty space in there, it's not funny. With that said, you could see just how easy it is to take the SID player machine language routines and use them from your own assembly language programs. So really quite fun. So in the 1986 follow-up book, Computes Music System for the C128 and 64, they introduced a karaoke file format, a, a words file. And to create this format, you needed to use a word processor. The two word processors that you can use were either SpeedScript or EasyScript. To stick with the theme of using Compute or Compute Gazette's program, I'm gonna use SpeedScript. So I copied the 3.2 version, which came from the May 1987 magazine, but SpeedScript does date all the way back to, ooh, I think January 1984. Um, so we're gonna use this. So the process starts here, load in SpeedScript. All right, we'll type run to run it. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna create one line of text for each measure in the music file. Now actually what it's really looking for is those flag commands that we put in when we were playing around the border color. Every time the music player sees a flag command, it shows the next line of text. And we have one per measure. So let's type in some lyrics. Cool, so now we have some lyrics. All we have to do now is save this, and you press F8 to save it. And we'll call this Mary.ss, which stands for a speed script. Save that to disk. And now we have a speed script file. So I'm gonna restart our computer. Unlike the first version of SID Player, the computer music system came with a disk with all the software. So I'm gonna put that into the drive, and we'll take a look at the disk. This disk came with a lot of stuff on it. But the file that we're interested in is this program here, which is ss slash wds, or speed script to words file. It's a basic program, so we'll just load this with comma eight. And before we run it, we're gonna eject our disk and put in 
the disk with our speech script file. Okay, we're gonna run this. It's gonna ask you if the name of the speech script file, we called it mary.ss. It's gonna ask you if the title of the song, it uses this title in the karaoke machine. So we're gonna call it uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb. And then it wants to know what to call the WDS file, but don't put in .wds. So we're just gonna type in Mary and it will save it as a WDS file. It's gonna show you the text it's converting. And now we have a WDS file. So we're gonna reboot our machine again. Instead of using the SID uh, karaoke player, I'm gonna use my favorite SID stereo program from the 1980s. And we're gonna load this with stereo player 10, 8, 1. A nice little boot screen. They have a really rather long intro, so I'm gonna press enter to skip it. I'm gonna change the disc to the one that has our songs on it. Then we press F5 to refresh this with the contents of that disc. And here we're gonna see the three songs we had. Now you'll notice that these two have an M next to it, which has music. And this one has a little W at the bottom, which means it has a words file. So we're just gonna press F1 to play it. And we should see our lyrics load in. Pretty cool, <laughs> very exciting. I've always wanted to create one of those with a kid, so I couldn't help to spend a few minutes and add that to this video. So thank you for taking this journey with me way back in time uh, to enjoy working with the original SID player. It brought back a lot of great memories for me when I was like 12 to 15 years old. Uh, while making this video, I've forgotten just how much time I spent listening to these music files way back then. I have to admit, I discovered bands when I was a kid that I never would have considered had I not heard the SID player versions first. I remember going to Tower Records and going, oh, I know that band from my Commodore 64. So. The song playing right now is actually a stereo SID across six channels, and it plays using an extra SID chip. I never knew anyone that had one of these when I was growing up in their computer, uh, and I think they made a cartridge version later. But I have to admit, it is the first time I'm ever hearing this song, and it sounds really, really good. Um, I had a ton of fun putting this video together, um, and I got quite sidetracked listening to many SID songs I had not heard before. There's a great archive over c64music.co.uk that has 16,000 plus songs. Some have lyrics, some have picture files. Uh, and it was just a blast just to go back and watch those. I'm um, very curious, what were some of your favorite Sid tunes uh, when, you were, when you were a kid? Well, as always, I appreciate everyone that watches these videos. Uh, thanks again and take care.